Once you're on an AFL list, trying to schedule in any time for these education sessions is next to impossible. There's so many different things that they have to do. And when they finally get it in, it's more just of a box, box ticking exercise. You might think you know all the situations and all the, the dangers, but until you actually get exposed to them, you don't. So you want to be um, proactive, not reactive. This is a slow burning thing. We're not just going to be able to implement something straight away. So it'll be uh, leaving a, long, a longer term legacy and reducing the number of incidents would be would be a big thing. You've got to have buy in from people, and you know it's it's you can produce all the online courses in the world and and do all that stuff, but unless people are buying into it, um, you know it it's it doesn't achieve what we want it to achieve. Education is the key. I mean, at the end of the day, we we want to prevent things from happening and. Um, you know, the ed education is the best way to achieve that. Welcome to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Our mission is to protect the integrity of sport and the health and welfare of those who participate in Australian sport. Hello and welcome to Sport Integrity Australia's podcast On Side. I'm Tim Gavel. Today we're going to be looking at Sport Integrity Australia's Athlete Advisory Group. The Athlete Advisory Group was originally formed in 2019 to assist Sport Integrity Australia's strategic direction and to help shape education strategies through their insights into the pressures and influences which can threaten the integrity of sport. The group includes former and current athletes from varying backgrounds in sports. Among the new members, Paralympic swimming champion Ellie Cole, Australian basketballer Jen O'Hay, and former West Coast Eagles captain Eric McKenzie. Today we're going to be speaking with Eric and Patria Thomas, a former member of the group and now SEA's Assistant Director Engagement. That's coming up shortly. Well, joining us now is former West Coast Eagles captain Eric McKenzie. Eric is an AFL Players Association Players Delegate and an international testing agency, Athlete Ambassador. We'll have a chat to Eric in just a moment. Also joining us is Patria Thomas, an Olympic swimming champion. Patria is chef de mission for the Australian Commonwealth Games team for Birmingham this year. And Patria, a former member of the group, is now SEA's Assistant Director Engagement. Well, firstly to you, Eric, why did you decide that this might be a good thing to join Sport Integrity Australia's Athlete Advisory Group? Um, it's something I've always played a, uh, or kept a close eye on. Um, the integrity of sport is huge. So the fact I can now have a voice um, and talk about it with people from a lot of other different sports and see what the common issues are that I experienced uh, in AFL and now seen across other sports is a really great experience for me. And I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from uh from AFL that can be used in other sports as well. We'll talk about those lessons learned as well as your experience in other sports and of course uh, the number of degrees that you have and how you've been able to apply those to sports. But Patria, you have been a member of the Athlete Advisory Group. What did you get out of it? Because you went in really not knowing a lot about Sport Integrity Australia, I guess. Yeah, look, Tim, my experience um, with ASADA back in the day um, was obviously focused on, you know, anti-doping testing and, and my experience as an athlete. So um, I had a degree of knowledge, but, you know, a re it was a real eye-opener, um, you know, when we had briefings from different areas within um, ASADA, even when it was focused solely on anti-doping, just the breadth of work that the organisation um, does. And, and that's obviously now increased um, a lot now with the other integrity threat areas coming under the banner of Sport Integrity Australia. So, look, I... Um, you know, I just wanted to contribute and give and give back, and that's why I joined the AAG. And we were like, you know, it was I was in the first sort of intake, so we were still sort of finding our feet and working out what our purpose was. But um, it was really about contributing and providing that athlete um, feedback and um, you know a take on things. I think and and doing that to to help um, you know Sada or now Sport Integrity. Australia to help shape its policies and, and things like that. Were you surprised when you went to that first meeting and you realised that some of the experiences that you had and I guess some of the frustrations and the insights that you provided were also there from other sports, totally different sports than yours? 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of common threads um, among sports. I mean, each sport has its own, um, you know, um, I suppose particular way things things happen. But generally the, the principles are all the same um, and, and the concerns and uh, things are all, all the same across uh, the majority of sports. So I think it's great that, um, you know, we have such a, a, a wide mix of uh, people involved in in our new group of AAG members. Um, we've got 12 members uh, this time around. So it adds a more uh, breadth of um, opinion and experience and um, feedback and, uh, and ideas, importantly. All right, Erica, uh, just on, I guess, your experience going into this, what was your impression of firstly ASADA and Sport Integrity Australia? Um, well, as Patricia said, Sport Integrity Australia is very new and we're actually talking about it just off air prior to this about how it was um, ASADA, which was purely anti-doping, but now Sport Integrity Australia covers all the integrity issues, which I think is great having it all under the one banner because... Uh, Doping, doping is one part of it, anti-doping is one part, but often um, there'll be other issues as well which um, the same athletes experience. So by having their knowledge and being able to share it under the one banner of sports integrity is um, a really, really good thing, I think. As, a, a, I guess, a, a player, a former player, and as well as somebody who has been involved in uh, getting a number of degrees, do you feel as though you're able to combine your theoretical background with your background from playing days into a role like this? Uh, I, I think I can add uh, a unique perspective um, to, to this group and I, I believe that's why, why I was added into it. Um, from my both my playing backgrounds, uh, 12 years at West Coast, but also uh, experience in the off-field stuff as well. Um, as you said, I, I do have um, a, back, uh, a couple of degrees under my belt, but also having been over to Switzerland and studied there, been in around the Olympic capital in Lausanne was a hugely eye-opening experience for me. Um, seeing the IOC um, and all the international federations based there, and that's how I ended up um, becoming an amb uh, athlete ambassador as well for the International Testing Agency too. So uh, to help them deliver their education um, pieces, it is supposed to be around events, but uh, since I came on board, uh, a little thing called COVID has stopped most of the major events for uh, us to be able to get to. So just tell us about the ITA. Um obviously very much focused on, on anti-doping. Now it is quite an expanded remit for Sport Integrity Australia. Is your focus very much on, on anti-doping or do you feel as though you can add a little bit extra to, to the Athlete Advisory Group? Um, I, I think I can certainly add a lot outside the anti-doping side of things as well. Um, there's a multitude of uh, integrity issues. Uh, my role uh, with Basketball WA at the moment is... Um, looking at all our policies in place, the child safeguarding, um, our gambling and all those different types of things. So I believe I do have a, a well-rounded knowledge that I can add to um, this group, but I do have, with my ITA backgrounds um, and having contacts there, I believe I can add a lot in that space as well. What do you see as the biggest threat to sport now in terms of an in integrity viewpoint? Uh, it's, it's the access people have to players um, that they never used to have. So um, the fact that phones um, have cameras, there, there's no hiding these days. Your public life um, is is very much public. There's, there's no private life for athletes anymore. So that, I believe, can be used against athletes. While it's really good and the vast majority of people um, – are really good at giving people space. People can use that to manipulate people. They catch catch them out doing something silly, and then that can be used against them. Um, so then they can, whether that is drugs or use it to, they know they've got a gambling problem, and they can manipulate results that way. Um, Patria, back in your day, um, sort of a few years ago when you came onto the scene, what what did you see as the major issue in sport in terms of integrity? Oh, well, certainly back in my swimming days, um, you know, there was a real focus on um, doping within in sport. And unfortunately, I swam in an area, era when that was quite prevalent um, with a number of countries. So 
But I think, um, I think you know, in recent years, our eyes have really been opened to other integrity threats, and um, obviously, particularly in recent times, the child safeguarding um, issues and and some of the coaching practices that have become ingrained in in the way people coach. Um, which, uh, you know, is concerning. I have kids myself and, you know, I know I want my kids to be able to go to their sport and um, um, that I'm confident that they're safe and that they feel safe while they're participating as well. So I think um, we've made a good start and I think that there's a long way to go to to, um, making significant, significant cultural change so that... Um, we can improve. Um, Do you feel as though athletes involved. feel more empowered now to to come out and speak about historical abuse? Um, yeah, look, absolutely. I think um, you know the whole athlete a um, uh, stuff that came out in the US and then sort of reverberated around the world has really, um, I think, given people more courage. Um, and they perhaps feel a little bit more safe um, speaking up about things. And I think obviously the role that Sport Integrity Australia is playing in the system now um, furthers that as well. So um, we're not there yet. Uh, I think there's still a ways to go in in terms of people feeling entirely comfortable to speak up. Um, but it's it's such an important um, uh, thing to do because you know the the, the it, it's just critical um, that we you know we keep marching forward and, and making um, sport a, a safer and a, a fairer place. Um, you mentioned there the practices of the past involved. and I guess it's not only coaches who've got to change but sport sports administration has to change as well, doesn't it? And I guess that's part of the national integrity framework in, in giving a guideline uh, to sporting organisations about how to handle these sort of things to prevent them happening in the future. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, uh, Tim. It's, um, you know, the introduction of the National Integrity Framework. And whilst it, it you know, might not be for all sports, but the, 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 the standards behind them is what we need to be working towards um, for, for all sports, uh, you know, um, in Australia. And, um, you know, it, it's a really important step forward, uh, I think, is to have that consistent approach to the standards that we expect our people involved in sport to live by. A question for both of you. Firstly, to, to you, Patria, and I'll get Eric to follow on from this, but when you came into swimming, was there enough education around about sport integrity, do you think? Not just talking about anti-doping, but talking about child safeguarding, possible manipulation of events. Was there enough there that you thought, well, I'm, I'm well informed now, I'm a, a young swimmer, and also to you, Eric, in just a moment when you were drafted in 2006, whether there was that education for you. But firstly, to you, Patria. Uh, the simple answer is no, Tim. There wasn't enough education and I still don't think there's enough education and that's obviously something they're working hard to um, roll out from a Sport Integrity Australia perspective. Education is the key. I mean, at the end of the day, we, we want to prevent things from happening and... Um, you know, the ed- education is the best way to achieve that, so. What were the education sessions like in those early days, especially as a young swimmer coming through? Oh, you know, n- not not much, to be honest, uh, Tim, back in the days. I mean, we would have had, you know, anti-doping presentations um, around what we sh- could and couldn't um, take um, and awareness around that stuff. But in terms of the other integrity areas, there really wasn't a lot Um that I can remember remember back when I was competing. Do you feel as though you were forced to fend for yourself a little bit? Um, I suppose to a degree. I suppose it, it's not a – they weren't sort of topics or things that people thought about a lot unless something happened and went wrong. I mean, then, then it was became an issue, but – I suppose just travelling along, um, if if everything was okay, then no one really thought about that stuff. Um, And that's obviously something that we're trying to shift now um, is that culture of actually really embedding um, those those, um, practices in our day-to-day operations and making sure that people um, are not just thinking about them when something goes wrong, but that they're thinking about, um, you know, how, how we keep sport safe and fair all the time. And whether you're engaged in the whole process as well because that's the key, isn't it, to getting athletes to understand exactly what the education is all about. 
yeah, exactly. You know, you've got to have buy-in from people, and you know, it's it's you can produce all the online courses in the world, and you know, and and do all that stuff, but unless people are buying into it, um, you know, it it's it doesn't achieve what we want it to achieve. So it's about finding innovative ways to to get the message out to um, both the organisations that run sport, um, because they're a big part of this, obviously, and then obviously the the members and the participants in sport as well. What about you, Eric? Back in that early day of uh, getting drafted, 2006, I'm sure you remember it well, but what, what sort of education was around for you and, and how can it be shaped to help athletes these days? Um, yeah, so I was probably lucky in that I was on the pathway from an early age, um, the AFL development pathway in terms of went through pretty standard 15s, 16s, 18s and was involved with the OES as well. So we did get education in and around that, but... The ones who only entered the pathway later and then into the AFL system, um, I don't believe would have got, like, I still don't think I got enough, but the ones who entered that way d- definitely wouldn't have got enough. And then once you're on an AFL list, trying to schedule in any time um, for these education sessions is next to impossible. There's so many different things that they have to do it. And when they finally get it in, it's more just of a box, box t- ticking exercise and there's no real engagement by the players. Everyone thinks they know, all right, well, that's um, that's not going to impact me. Um, so they'll tune out, and often it's done um, after a main training session or something. So all you want to do is just almost go back, go somewhere and go to sleep. So you don't actually take anything in. Um, and so that's that's definitely where it, it can be improved. And I think how, how it is delivered is, is huge, um, especially to the young guys. And actually brought this up in the last meeting was everyone learns in a different way. So some people, uh, you just give them the information to, to read on a sheet of paper. Others prefer pictures. Others prefer, especially the younger generation coming through, would rather watch videos and those type of things. So... Um, there just needs to be different methods of delivery for this education as well and then actually see if and follow up to see if it's been retained. Uh, almost a, a role-playing situation too, uh, get the athletes in, engaged in some form of exercise where they would be in a situation where they need to make a decision and it's based around integrity. Yeah, definitely. Uh, role-playing is good because you... You might think you know all the situations and all the the dangers, but until you actually get exposed to them, you don't. So it's you want to be um, proactive, not reactive. Um, as Patria said, it's better off the education and preventing these things to happen. You look at a couple of incidents lately. There's a lot of great learnings from it, but um, they need to be used going forward to stop things like this happening again. And what have you learned already um, hearing from other athletes and former athletes about their experiences? I'm sure they've learned a lot from you. What, what have you learned from, from fellow members? Uh, that there is a lot of similarities between the sports. Um, where me coming from a team sport um, and having doctors which did everything for us, we, we really got spoon-fed, whereas... Um, ones from less well-funded sports, more individual sports, then the then it goes back onto the individual a lot more, especially when we talk about um, the anti-doping side of things, what they put in their body. They're the ones who are going out and sourcing it, whereas we were able to get everything batch tested and those type of things. So we had a lot of um, protections in place to stop those things happening, but the individuals and less funded don't have those in place. And that's something I definitely learned from my ITA education as well, um, in that these individual sports, especially smaller nations, Australia does it well. We have a lot of education in place, but these other nations which don't um, and rely on uh, getting to these events and then getting the education there, they're the ones where the issues certainly arise. Patria, what did you learn from your time in the group? Oh, look, I, I think uh, similar to what Eric said is that a lot of the the experiences are shared across the sports. And as I said before, there's there's some, you know, peculiar, peculiarities in some sports that do things a little bit differently. But all in the whole, the principles are the same, I think. Um, and um, it, I think it's always great. Um, you know, you have your own perspective and experiences that you that you draw from, but hearing other people's stories um, has been really uh, critical, I think, as well. And, you know, in um, 
in the AAG when I was involved as a, as a member, um, you know, we had um, athletes that had um, either, uh, you know, tested positive inadvertently or, or de- um, you know, had deliberately taken performance enhancing drugs. And, and it was really interesting hearing uh, their stories and, um, and, you know, I suppose the effects, um, you know, that um, testing positive can have on someone as well. Um, you know, uh, from a personal perspective. So um, really interesting to hear that. And I think it's it's really important to have that diverse um, experience as well. Um, so we can, you know, we, we can understand those differences. And, and now we've obviously expanded to um, look at other integrity areas. I mean, the, there's a lot of passionate people out there around, around trying to make sport safer for people. And, um, you know, those diverse experiences really help us um, from a Sport Integrity Australia perspective to to shape our policies and understand how best to connect with, with athletes. Do you feel as though y- your voice was heard? Um, you, you know, that something you said resulted in change? Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I know, you know, the the athlete advisory group's not just a box ticking exercise for us. We genuinely want to um, learn from the the athletes, um, and I think, um, you know, that's the athletes are probably the the biggest stakeholder in sport. Let's face it. Um, so it's really important that we're listening to, to them as a stakeholder group and understanding their concerns and and uh, developing initiatives and and um, things to do to do things better in the future as well. I think that's really critical. Eric, what what do you hope um, that your voice will result in? That you, the, the experiences that you have had through study, being involved in a number of sports, but as a former player, is is there a single thing that you'd like to? to be involved in that would lead to change? Um, it's probably going to be looking back on it um, after a period of time. I don't think this is a slow a slow burning thing. We can't, we're not just going to be able to implement something straight away. So it'll be uh, leaving a, long, a longer term legacy and getting and reducing the number of incidents would be, would be a big thing. Um, but look, we, ne- we can't change everything at once. So it's going to be, all right, what's, they're going to be the focus for this current group and that's probably what we're going to work out in the next meeting or two, what it is that we want to um, leave our legacy on. Have you, have you got something in mind that you'd like to leave your legacy? Um, oh, oh, not, not particularly one thing. Um, it's it's tightened up. I like this national um, the, the framework that's going out um, that Sport Integrity Australia is doing. So it's getting all the um, the – National bodies to sign up to that would be a great start. Um, so if we can do that and push that out, that would be a, gr- a good start. And you're looking forward to your time on on the athlete advisory group. You're sort of going to be energised by it. Do you think? I sure am. As, as I said, like, I've, I'm really enjoying uh, getting to meet these people and, and hearing their stories as well. As Patria said, everyone, everyone there has different stories, whether it's the um, they've been involved firsthand. Um, or they've experienced it in teammates and those type of things. Everyone, everyone's there for a reason, and they want change. So, um, oh, yeah, I'm I'm very excited and energised, as you said, to to get on this group and um, and the discussions as well. I'm looking forward to actually getting there in person because it's the water cooler chats, which actually are um, yep. I, I think almost better than the official formal ones as well. Good on you, Eric. Thanks very much for that. And Patria, you're virtually a mentor now to this new group coming through. It is great to have you involved. Thanks very much for joining us on Sport Integrity Australia's onside for both of you. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. And now for our segment from Left Field, where we answer a question from the public. Hi, my name's Annabelle and I'm a competitive sport climber and athlete educator. The question I have from left of field today is, do coaches get in trouble if their athlete tests positive? If an athlete tests positive, it's possible that their coach will be investigated. The coach doesn't automatically get in trouble. However, if it's found that they were assisting the athlete in doping, they could be sanctioned and banned from sport. Well, thanks for joining us today on Onside, where we looked at the Athlete Advisory Group. We'll be back with another episode shortly. You've been listening to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. 
send in your podcast questions or suggestions to media at sportintegrity.gov.au. For more information on Sport Integrity Australia, please visit our website, www.sportintegrity.gov.au or check out our Clean Sport app.